Hello guys, good day to all of you. This is Dr. S. Krishna Kumar here. Another day, another exam, and another recall session recording. This time, it is the most recently concluded INICT May exam. So, we will discuss the physiology questions asked here. As I saw, the questions around 11 questions came from physiology proper. So, if you include a clinical applied physiology, it will be more definitely but proper physiology questions, around 11 questions came. We are going to discuss that. Again, I saw the questions. Uh, they came from the more familiar repeat topics. So, aims never disappointing us these days. So, options may be slightly tricky, but it should be there. So, the questions were very easy. I will show you the questions. You try to answer them. You know the drills already. Then we will discuss the concepts. Now, the first question, guys. From a very familiar area. Erythropoietin is produced by. So, when you see this question, the relevance, just uh, think about a, a chronic kidney disease patient who is undergoing dialysis. We usually give the erythropoietin drug form from outside. Why? Because his kidney, chronic kidney disease, is not able to produce the erythropoietin. That is the relevance of this question. So, every time you read anything, immediately relate it with the most practical encounter you ever had, maybe during internship or when seeing a patient. That's how you can understand the significance of the question and you can retain that for long. So, next time when you see erythropoietin, don't just see that as an erythropoietin. It is helping someone in a nephro ICU. Erythropoietin, very important, is produced by Kidney, obviously, the obvious source. The next important source is liver. Spleen, lungs, no relevance here. So, what should be the answer here? We have an important option that is 1 and 2. Computer G, click C. Yes. Answer is C. A very important discussion now. Majority of the points already you know. Something is definitely new, I am sure. I will tell you. First question. What is the structure of this compound erythropoietin? It belongs to glycoprotein. Very important. Second question. What is the major source, guys? I told you. Kidney, obviously. What percentage? 85 percentage. The remaining 15 percentage come from liver. Remember the periperi -peri flavor. Why sir periperi? -peri? That peri is the important thing to remember here. What are all the sources in kidney, sir? Peritubular capillary bite cells. What about liver? Perivenous hepatocytes. It was asked before, particularly this kidney cell, peritubular capillary bed cells. Are this the only two exclusive sources? Some amount of erythropoietin is also shown to be found in other locations. Remember these three areas, maybe a future potential MCQ. Any guess? Any idea? Yes, brain, uterus, and oviducts. So, collectively, kidney. Liver, brain, uterus and oviducts. Next. What is the major stimuli? You all know. Definitely it should be hypoxia. Whenever there is hypoxia, you definitely need erythropoietin. Why? Because of its action. So, the next major stimuli. We all know guys, men tend to have more RBC. Why? What is the reason? The androgen, testosterone. It stimulates erythropoietin, it stimulates erythropoiesis, RBC number will increase. So, other than hypoxia, also remember androgens. One more, A. It is very, very important, particularly in high altitude. Obviously, there is hypoxia, you will get erythropoietin. Not only that, it is shown that alkalosis we encounter in the high altitude is also known to stimulate erythropoietin. Other than that, what about sympathetic nervous system, sir? This may be a new point to you. It will be a future MCQ, catecholamines. Remember, catecholamines, particularly the beta receptor action, is known to elevate erythropoietin levels. Important. Next, what is the action? Why during hypoxia, erythropoietin comes? It increases RBC number. How? By preventing their death. It increases its longevity, it increases its number by preventing their death. What it means? It inhibits apoptosis of red cells. This is the most important action of our very well-known 
erythropoietin, EPO. I told you, imagine someone in a, a nephrology intensive care unit undergoing dialysis treatment. What is the drug form of erythropoietin? Recombinant drug forms we give from outside. Any idea? Two important names, epoietin alpha, dorbipoietin alpha, particularly in chronic kidney diseases, anemia of chronic diseases, patient undergoing dialysis, so erythropoietin. So that is the relevance. They asked this question, definitely 85% from kidney. The next major is liver. Minor amounts are also found in brain, uterus, ovidex. Simple. Now let's move to the next question. A uh, very favorite question, very simple question. Which of the following are properties of ventricular cardiac muscle? See, nerve fibers, all muscle fibers, they will definitely obey all or none phenomenon. Cardiac muscle, all or none phenomenon, it will obey. Length tension relationship is there. I will show you a graph. Long refractory period, I will also show you. But I told you many times in our video classes, cardiac muscle should not be tetanized rather than cannot be tetanized it should not be tetanized because it have to contract and pump blood to all the body region it should never undergo tetanization so it cannot be tetanized so which of the following are properties of ventricular cardiac muscle one two and three are properties fourth is not the property now look very carefully the answer is d length tension relationship Obviously, you will see a graph with x-axis and y-axis. This x-axis is about the length changes. Y-axis is about the tension changes. Yes. Now, we can clearly see. As we increase the length, the tension increases. Yes, sir. Not indefinitely. The tension keeps on increasing. At one particular point, it reaches plateau. And it is beginning to fall down. Which one? Even though the length is increasing, after some point of time, tension decreases. This is why we use the classical word. What is that word? Within physiological limits. Within physiological limits, length increases, tension increases. That is the take home message from the graph. Now, relate this to cardiac muscle. What is the length here, sir? How the length of the cardiac muscle fiber is going to change? If you stretch the cardiac muscle fiber, stretching length will change. So, stretching length will change. So, length changes are related to stretching by blood. And what is this blood volume that is stretching? Our very well known end diastolic volume. That means this length changes are equated with end diastolic volume. It is the functional equivalent. What about tension, sir? Tension is the cardiac muscle contraction, the force of contraction, obviously. So, now we know length is the end diastolic volume changes. Tension is the force of contraction generated. A very important law. Obviously, there is no surprise here. You know already. And what the law states that? Force of contraction is always directly proportional to initial length of muscle fiber within physiological limits. So, if you go beyond that, if you keep on stretching further, further, further and further, it will not be beneficial to the system. So, what is this law called as Frank Starling law? What is this graph? If you see a picture based question, this is the length tension relationship of a cardiac muscle where we study Frank Starling law. So, the force of contraction is directly proportional to the initial length of the muscle fiber within physiological limits. If you increase the in diastolic volume, the force of contraction will definitely increase to send all the blood out. But this happens only within physiological limits. First property. Second, this is a very well known ventricular action potential. What is this, sir? This is ventricular action potential. This is an electrical event. This will be followed by a mechanical event that is ventricular muscle contraction. I will show you that. Yes. Now, this action potential will definitely have refractory periods. Two refractory periods are there. The first one is our absolute refractory period. The second one is our relative refractory period. From the onset of the action potential till 
initial third of repolarization, what we have is the absolute refractory period. So, after that till the end of action potential, relative refractory period. So, what is the important point to be observed here, sir? Major part of the contraction, you can clearly say, major part of the contraction from here till this point, it is in its absolute refractory period. Very important. Now, we know there is refractory periods. Since the major part of the contraction falls in absolute refractory period, if I play here by giving few more stimuluses, another action potential is not possible, another muscle contraction is not possible. So, you cannot summate contractions here. Summation of contraction is a prerequisite for tetanization. When there is no summation of contractions, tetany is not possible. Very important. Major part of contraction lies within the absolute refractory period. If you give more stimulus here, they will not summate. That is the next point. There is no summation. So, tetanization is not possible in cardiac muscle. Because the major part of its contraction lies within absolute refractory period. And it also has got a long refractory period. We are clearly seeing. Very important topic. Next. Year after year, session after session. Examiners will never get sleep if they don't set a question from sleep EEG. Look here. Identify the stage of sleep from the given image. So, what are we clearly seeing? Very simple, guys. No need to look anything. First, only look into this electro-oclography. There is an eye movement shown here and this corresponding EEG. Resembling wakefulness, showing a beta wave. So, this is none other but our REM sleep. Because we are noticing eye movement here, this itself is sufficient to pick the answer. Electromyography, the muscle recording will show no activity because of atonia. And what is this sleep, sir? REM sleep. Asked many times before, no confusion, it is REM. Now, what is the EEG wave syndrome sleep? I told you already. Because the EEG resembles wakefulness, you will see beta wave. Yes, sir. The wave of attention, the wave of wakefulness, beta wave. What is the other name? You need to remember. The EEG is resembling wakefulness, but the subject is sleeping. There is a paradox here. That is why we call this as a paradoxical sleep. I told you. The reason is, the EEG is resembling a wakeful state because it is showing beta wave. But the subject is sleeping, we call this as paradoxical sleep. What are all these PGO spikes? That is the most important prerequisite for a REM sleep, eye movement. What it stands for? Ponto geniculo occipital spikes. This is the one that coordinates the eyeball movements during REM sleep. That is how it derived its name, eye movement. Muscles, we know all the muscles in body undergo atonia flat EMG, not all muscles. If this most important muscle undergo atonia, you will die during sleep. What is that muscle? Diaphragm. And your eyeball muscles, they are exceptions. They will never undergo atonia. Sparing this to all the other muscles in body in general undergo muscle atonia during REM sleep. So, which important neurotransmitter is responsible for this REM sleep? We have REM on. That means, if these neurons are active, you will move into REM sleep, acetylcholine obviously. That important REM neurotransmitter is acetylcholine, REM on neurons, REM on neurons, acetylcholine, yes. Favorite repeat topic, REM sleep. Next, one of the most simplest out of all the questions and seeing this question, I felt very happy. You see? Your mood inside the exam hall is very, very important. When you see questions like this, your mood will be totally elevated and in a happy mood, your performance will always enhance. Which hormone are produced from the zones labeled in the image given? So, obviously, this is about our adrenal cortex and adrenal medulla, right? Very simple. So, this zone A is our zona glomerulosa. This B is our zona fasciculata. The C is our zona reticularis. D is obviously the adrenal medulla. 
the first three a b c are cortical layers d is medulla so from zona glomerulosa aldosterone comes so option a having aldosterone here yes fasciculata cortisol comes reticularis adrenal sex steroids androgens and from adrenal medulla predominantly it is epinephrine so direct straightforward question the answer is obviously option d adrenal cortex and adrenal medulla next question which of the following condition may lead to a decrease in gfr so if you take back into the history of inict exam particularly in physiology definitely a question come from gfr and its regulation which of the following condition may lead to a decrease in gfr another common thing renal calculi renal stones which starling force it is going to affect Increase in Bowman capsule hydrostatic pressure can decrease GFR. Why? Not told by me, it was told long ago by Newton. What is Newton's third law? For every action, there is equal and opposite reaction. So, what is the action? The action is our filtration. We are able to see into this blue color arrow. Fluid is getting filtered. A major starling force that favor filtration. Who is he? It is the glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure we call PC. This important action will be opposed by two important opposing forces. What are those two opposing? Shown in black color arrow marks here. Look into the arrow mark here. This blue one is favoring. These two black ones are opposing. The major one opposing obviously is because of our proteins. They are the oncotic pressure in glomerular capillary. And the next important opposing force is the hydrostatic pressure in the Bowman's space. This is what we call PB. By any chance, if this hydrostatic pressure in Bowman's space increases, it is an opposing force. Obviously, it will decrease my GFR. Correct? If this oncotic pressure in glomerular capillary, if it increases, it is an opposing force, it will decrease my GFR. If the hydrostatic pressure in the capillary PC, if this increases, it favors filtration. That means it will increase my GFR. So, the opposing forces, whenever they increase, our GFR will fall. Now, let us go back into the question. We can clearly see now in the question. Which of the following condition may lead to a decrease in GFR? Obviously, increase in Bowman capsule hydrostatic pressure decreases GFR. Increase in glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure, this may increase GFR, we have discussed. Decrease in glomerular oncotic pressure increases GFR because it is an opposing force. If the opposing force is decreasing, GFR will increase. Increase in renal blood flow will definitely increase the GFR. So, what is the answer? Decrease in GFR, it is option A. So, this is the discussion we had and the clinical relevance I told you already. This hydrostatic pressure in Bowman space PB will be increased whenever there is an obstruction in the form of renal calculi. Renal stones. So, renal stones can decrease GFR. So, the answer is elevated hydrostatic pressure in Bowman space can decrease our GFR. Very familiar topic. Please be very thorough with the starling forces. Next question. Identify the hormones marked in the image given. See guys, from hypothalamus, a factor A is coming. It is stimulating somatotrophs in anterior pituitary. That means something concerned with growth hormone. So, this A should be a growth hormone, releasing hormone because it stimulates. This B factor is inhibiting, that means it is my somatostatin, right? Somatostropes in anterior pituitary is going to release growth hormone. This growth hormone will act in liver to form somatomedins. We all know the other name for somatomedin is insulin like growth factor. Now, let us fill all the puzzles. So, what is this option? A, growth hormone, releasing hormone. 
B is somatostatin, C is growth hormone itself and D is the one coming from liver, insulin like growth factor 1. Another straightforward direct question. Next question. The answer is D. Identify the correct sequence of intracellular signaling. I told this topic many times in our video classes. Very important one. This is about the second messenger system. Remember, questions always come from second messengers, the C factors, cyclic AMP, calcium, cyclic GMP. Any idea? The starting point, the enzyme is obviously adenyl cyclase, which leads to formation of cyclic AMP. And all the downstream actions are mediated through protein kinases, A for A. For cyclic AMP, it is protein kinase A. Now, let's look into the diagram, guys. Now, look very carefully. It all starts with our G protein coupled receptor, where the hormone should bind. This hormone is the first messenger. Whenever the first messenger hormone binds, this important adenylyl cyclase enzyme is activated, leading to formation of our second messenger cyclic AMP, which activates protein kinase A. Now, this protein kinase A is the one which will affect our genetic machinery, DNA. We have cyclic AMP response elements, RE here, that eventually leads to formation of lot of proteins which can be synapse forming, which can be survival enhancing, which can be growth proliferating, anything. This protein is a product of something because of the action created by our protein kinases in the genetic machinery. So, what is the sequence? Adenylyl cyclase, cyclic AMP, protein kinase, A sequence. Simple. Now, the next question. A 45-year-old man presents with proximal muscle weakness, purplish stretch marks, obesity and easy bruising. What is this condition? Immediately you can answer this is hypercortisolism. A very, very well-known familiar syndrome. And what is that syndrome, sir? Cortisol excess. This is our Cushing syndrome, where you can definitely see easy bruisability, stretch marks, pendulous abdomen, lemon on stick appearance, obesity. Remember, this easy bruisability, stretch marks, they are because our cortisol is known to inhibit something called as fibroblast proliferation. Very important. Cortisol inhibits fibroblast proliferation. Not only that, it also inhibits collagen formation. These are the important reasons why there is this purplish stretch marks, delayed wound healing. You also see obesity. What is this condition? Cortisol excess. Hussing syndrome. A very favorite question. Proximal muscle weakness because cortisol is proteolytic. It destroys muscle proteins, muscle weakness, purplish stretch marks, obesity, easy bruising. This is our very well known Cushing syndrome. Important concept. Next question. When blood pressure rises, which neurotransmitter is released at the level of SA node? Another baroreceptors, baroreflex are our very good friends. Definitely it will give you mark. You can, you can answer clearly. So, what is the effect of baroreflex? Blood pressure will decrease, heart rate will decrease because of acetylcholine. A very familiar sequence, guys. When the baroreceptors are activated, distension of baroreceptors due to increase in blood pressure, the starting point, definitely it increases firing in baroreceptor. Now, the information goes to medulla. It was an INACT MCQ. What is the center for this reflex? Medulla nucleus tracta solitarius. Now, first, a small sequence need to be remembered here. This nucleus tracta solitarius initially excites caudal ventrolateral medulla with the help of glutamate. It is the CVLM which inhibits our RVLM with the help of GABA. What is this RVLM, sir? It is the sympathetic center. If you inhibit rostral ventrolateral medulla, there is sympathetic inhibition. So, as a part of baroreflex, 
the sympathetic inhibition. Side by side, in the other end, you will have activation of parasympathetic vagal neurons. So, obviously, vagus will release acetylcholine. So, what will be the effect? What is the overall effect? The starting point is increase in blood pressure. We will end up with fall in blood pressure, fall in heart rate, bradycardia. It is because of which neurotransmitter is released here? Acetylcholine. Baroreflex means sympathetic inhibition, parasympathetic activation. So, acetylcholine, fall in BP, fall in heart rate. Now, next question. Which of the following is not true about ABO blood groups? ABO blood group contain antibodies to A and B. We have anti-A, anti-B. These antigens are carbohydrate in nature. True. A is true, B is true. These antibodies are naturally present since birth. No. It will minimum take 3 to 6 months for them to develop. It is not naturally present since birth. These antibodies are predominantly IgM. See, ABO. See, RH antibodies are IgG. Here it is about the ABO blood group discovered by our Carl Landsteiner. These antibodies are predominantly IgM. So, this is true. So, these antibodies are naturally present since birth is false. It takes time to establish minimum 3 to 6 months. So, what is the answer here? Option C. Yes, C. Now, guys, the next question. So, AIMS these days is definitely not a surprising thing. One question from practical physiology they are asking. See, on seeing this question, some uh, nostalgic memories come to us, right? We all did this during our first year MBBS, making fun with our friends, standing near the window, looking into the comparator, did the color came for you, observing these beautiful colors, color changes. Yes, Sally's calorimetric method, hemoglobin estimation. See, definitely this method, there is a comparator. You also need a Sally Pippet, whose name, full name is Sally Adam Pippet. And a graduated HB tube, hemoglobin tube, all are needed. But this RBC pipette is not needed for this practical Sally method. So, the answer for the question is RBC pipette is not needed. In this method, we use, remember guys, N by 10 HCl. N by 10 HCl, the acid is used when it reacts with the blood with the hemoglobin. It leads to formation of something called as acid hematin, which is dark brown in color. So, to this acid hematin, we will add either distilled water or buffered water and observe whether the color when it matches with this in the comparator. So, this is the method, Sally method for estimation of hemoglobin. Particularly still this method is done in some peripheral health centers, PHC is very easy method to find out hemoglobin levels. So, RBC paper is not used. So, these are all the questions, 11 questions you can clearly see. Majority of the questions you can clearly answer, very fast we can answer. So, physiology in recent times in INICT, questions are definitely coming from the previous year topics. So, that is why I am stressing the importance of previous year topics. So, please be thorough with the previous year topics. And my good luck and best wishes are always there for you guys. My heartiest congratulations. Good luck and best wishes. Thank you.